Hello, my name is Clara Mavella and I set up the Cultural Entrepreneurship Institute in Berlin. Today we are in Potsdam and uh, my guest is Philipp Kadelbach, the founder of Flightright. Schön, hier bei Flightright zu sein, Herr Dr. Kadelbach. Good to see you here at Flightright, Dr. Kadelbach. Would you like to introduce yourself? Very happy to. Thank you for the invitation. Well, we invited you here. I'm Dr. Philipp Kadelbach and I founded Flightright. Flightright is an air passenger rights portal. That is, we help consumers to enforce their claims against airlines if their flights are delayed or cancelled. Historically, it was very difficult because consumers aren't on an equal footing with airlines, but we've created a very interesting model, I think. I did it because I always had a bit of a foible for consumer protection. I actually studied law here in Berlin at the Free University and then in South Africa. I did my PhD on consumer protection and the EU. Then I practiced as a lawyer. I'm married, I have two children and I live in Potsdam. Fantastic. But you are a widely acclaimed entrepreneur and the portal is really hits the spot. Would you like to tell us about your path to success? I'm happy to do that. Really, the project began a bit as a sideline. And I've read that a lot of good ideas start as sidelines. The trigger for me was that I had a flight which was delayed in 2009 from Amsterdam to Berlin. And my flight was delayed five hours. And then on the way back, it was delayed seven hours. So I started wondering, what can you do as an air passenger? What rights do you have? And I had a look at the EU regulation on air passenger rights. And I saw that we have a lot of rights as consumers, depending how far the journey is and how many hours late you are, you can get 250, 400 or 600 euros back from the airline. But it was also clear to me that airlines perhaps aren't too happy to do that, simply pay money to consumers on a voluntary basis. I wrote to Transavia, that's a Dutch airline, and said, hey guys, your flight didn't really work out, please pay me 250 euros twice. And I quickly got an answer. Yes, of course, we'll have a look at the case. We'll be back to you in eight or ten weeks. And of course, they never got back to me. And as a lawyer, of course, you say, well, what can you do? Well, of course, you could take them to court, but then you wonder whether that makes sense. You've got a big company out there based in another country. Are you going to take them to court over 250 euros? You have to serve the claim in another country. You have to invest money in legal costs, and you don't know if you're going to win. All for 250 euros. So I found out later there's a an expression for what I experienced in research and in jurisprudence, it's called rational disinterest, which means that you have a justifiable claim, but because there's such resistance, typically from a company, it's hard to enforce. And I noticed that airlines have been relying on that for many years, because they say, well, no one's really going to do it. They're not going to come and get the money from us. They said it was force majeure, or it doesn't apply here, or whatever. And consumers were unable to enforce their claims. So if you look at how often this kind of thing happens, how many people fly in Europe every year, it wasn't just me, it was five million people a year who were suffering from this problem. And five million people all together who were not enforcing their claims. So that was the point where I said to myself, well, what can we do to change that? How can you empower consumers? And there were a number of components which simply clicked together here. The fact that I am interested in consumer protection, I am a bit of a David versus Goliath guy, and then I have the legal background plus the interest in IT, which I've always been fascinated in. And 
it was a nice idea to empower consumers. So that was really the trigger for foundation, where all these things came together, and I thought, okay, let's look. Perhaps there's a model here that we can use to change it so that we can place the consumers on an equal footing with the airlines so they can enforce their claims and they're not just a piece of paper. But you were only able to expand after 2014. What was so important about 2014? There was a ruling, wasn't there, at EU level. I think before that you had to take them all to court. Yes. What actually happened was that, of course, there were one, two people. I did this with a friend from Hamburg. There were two of us. And, of course, we didn't have an awful lot of capital to invest either. So we would simply write letters to airlines, a hundred, a thousand letters, pay this money to consumer A, B, and we represent them. And then the airlines must have thought, let these guys try it. We'll show them what's what, those two guys from Potsdam and Hamburg. And of course, they didn't pay. So for us, it meant that we had to raise over 60,000 suits, 20,000 in the end. And of course, the district court in Brussels, I think, employed another 30 judges just to deal with us. And that's what the airlines wanted. They were hoping that we would simply run out of energy and people would lose faith in the whole idea. It was pretty hard work, but we stuck with it. And 98% of the cases, we won in court. So the airlines, the adversaries in the German court cases and Italy and so forth, found it quite expensive because loser pays in court in those countries. So if you not only lose the case but have to pay for it as well, it's expensive for the airlines. You have to pay for your legal advice. So after about 18 months, they suddenly realized that we weren't going to go away, that we kept winning, that it was becoming increasingly expensive, and they started to rethink. Maybe we should accept that something new is happening. Maybe what we've been doing for years isn't working anymore, that we can try to deplete consumers' rights at their expense, because suddenly we've got flight right, and they only get paid when they're successful. It's really easy, and we're seeing more and more actions pursued. And then the airlines started to pay us directly. And that, if you like, was the lubricating oil in our machine, because we were able to expand abroad, and our financial situation improved, it became a little bit easier, but it was a very lean period, the first 18 months. Our users need to hear that, that you weren't immediately successful. It wasn't stardust falling. You had to work on it at first, didn't you? I just wanted to mention this Do Not Pay by Joshua Browder. That's another example of legal tech, as they call it these days. That also arose because of his personal frustration about parking tickets he thought he shouldn't have. And your portal is another example of using artificial intelligence to help ordinary citizens so they can enforce their interests and make their lives easier. But a lot of people are scared of digital intelligence. Why do you think that is? I think one of the primal fears is that a lot of people think computers take jobs away, or will in the long term, and that the job they've been doing for years, decades, centuries, if you talk about professions and guilds, are going to be replaced by computers, and I think that is a fear that I can understand. I can see where they're coming from. The other fear, of course, is that it's not entirely human. You don't really grasp how it happens. With a human being, you can often see why a particular decision was taken. But a computer, the way it makes its decisions, especially if we're talking about artificial intelligence and neural networks, 
the computers that we're using now, people don't understand how decisions get taken. You get an outcome, and if you look at it, you know that that outcome makes sense. But nevertheless, you don't really know how it happened. And I think that too creates a certain fear. But despite that, to take our example, it's fairly clear that we use that technology to do something not in order to take people's jobs away from them, but because in this tiny little low threshold area, these small claims, without the technology, without the artificial intelligence, it simply wasn't possible in the past to enforce claims because no lawyer in the world is going to say, okay, I'll take your case on, give me 50 euros, because there's a lot of work involved. A lawyer is going to have to invest three, four hours in this and a lawyer isn't going to do that for 50, 70 euros. So this technology is the enabler. It's what makes it possible to create a level playing field between the consumers and the companies. So for us, I think this fear is not justified. We were only able to create this model thanks to the technology. We haven't taken anything away from anyone. Nevertheless, I think the origins if you look at the technology, people are skeptical and for justifiable reasons. If you look at the future, someone said that in 2032, I think we reached the point of singularity, where computers will on average be cleverer than people and will be able to improve themselves. And I'm a bit scared of that myself. And I think a lot of the pioneers in Silicon Valley also say that artificial intelligence needs to be regulated and we need to take care. I wouldn't like to rule out that really being the case. But I think we have to say that flight right activates target groups that otherwise would never have a thought of going to a lawyer to sort their problem out. So it's, if you like, a new quality, a new segment that you're serving. Of course, I would say that legal tech is something that we've pioneered. We've been doing this now for seven and a half years, and the last year and a half it's been quite hyped. And it's true. If you look at how lawyers work and very often they're sitting there on their high horses. I know because I've been a lawyer myself, so I'm allowed to say this. You say, come to me, make an appointment, come into my office, we'll set up a file, make a down payment. And especially the younger generation today are accustomed to low threshold, internet-based solutions. And that sector wasn't responding to it because they were protected from competition by this bubble of professional codes. Lawyers can't be paid according to whether they're successful in court or not. They're not allowed to take customers away from other lawyers because the professional status of lawyers enjoys a particular protection. So then technologies and the kind of low threshold stuff we're offering has got things moving. And now we can see that lawyers too are beginning to question the way they do things. It's lightened things up a bit and I think that's good. It's good for the clients to see a little bit more competition, a little bit more client focus. So I think that in our field we are a bit of a pioneer. Something I think is good is, as you mentioned, in Silicon Valley and these big companies that are scary, with portals like FlightRight, ordinary citizens are being helped. Their democratic rights are being implemented. So it's not a big group deciding what's good for you or bad for you. And that's extremely important if we look at the ethical relevance of technology. 
and take a closer look at what exactly is important. We're talking about ordinary citizens who make those decisions about what they want to do with the technology. So that's why I think it's such a fantastic thing. And in addition to that, we have to say that companies like yours also create jobs. These jobs didn't exist in the past. And perhaps you can tell us how many people you employ. But certainly this is also a movement. Yes, certainly. We started out just the two of us and now we have almost a hundred people working for us. And we hope to carry on growing. Of course, the technology helps, the internet helps to be relatively simple in your marketing. We are active in eight EU countries based from Potsdam. Without the internet, we couldn't have done that. So thanks to technology, we are able to work really efficiently. And that helps us to be cost efficient and make profits and continue to expand the services we offer and generate more jobs. So, oh, and also the other thing you said, it's true that something was lacking in the equilibrium between companies and consumers. Because if consumers and air passengers heard that their rights didn't really have any validity, then they had to simply acquiesce because they had no way of challenging it. And quite typically that's a feeling that, well, firstly, we have to ask the question for ethical reasons because we know that the airlines know that what they were saying was wrong. But we have to establish an equilibrium, which we did, so that the customers, the passengers, have an opportunity to decide for themselves whether they accept that decision by the airline or whether they say, I don't believe what you're saying and I want someone to help me change this. I think this is a very contemporary issue and you mentioned Silicon Valley. It's important if you have stronger companies, if you look at those big groups in Silicon Valley, they have tremendous power compared with their customers because you can do almost nothing without them anymore. But there has to be some institution out there that can regulate it a little and ask questions and, if it comes to the crunch, make decisions that go against their interests and enforce the rights of the consumers. And what the politicians need to do above all is to create consumer rights laws, but they don't really ensure that those rights can be implemented. And that's something that Flight Right and others have been doing. We have the laws, but we need to apply them. And technology helps. Fantastic. So we could envisage a model working in other fields too, in other sectors, whether we're talking about tax advice or medicine, so that the kind of vacuous, mindless work can be done by software and human beings with their creative nuance can concentrate on the more complex cases. Yes, I certainly think that this can be applied in other segments and will be. It doesn't have to be the case, like with us, that artificial intelligence is used to make quite complex decisions. There's nothing mindless about this. Airlines are not mindless. But to grant people access to those professions that are highly protected, whether it's accountants or lawyers, and there are some people who prefer to do things online rather than receiving letters. There's a study in Germany that says that 80% of people who go to a lawyer would, if they had a serious problem, not or only do it because they have a serious problem. They're frightened of lawyers. They don't want to pay too much or they're not quite sure how it works. And there's a tremendous opportunity here. If we start to question that and say, we need to make this more low threshold. We need to focus more on the clients and perhaps offer cheaper options 
because then you could tap into completely new client groups that otherwise simply would not come and see you. So there's an opportunity there for both sides, for the clients, for the customers, consumers, and for the professionals coming to accept that there's no point in hiding behind professional rules. They need to embrace these methods and say, fantastic, there's potential here. And there are new things that we can do that are in keeping with the times. Very practical question. How does it work, your portal? Our oh, portal. Yes, we need to know. Of course you do. What happens is that you, for example, suffer a flight delay more than three hours, and something tells you that perhaps you might have some rights that you can claim so that you are compensated for that delay. And then either you've already heard of us, or you Google, or you read something in the newspaper, you come to our website, and you have to key in your flight number and the date. It takes about two minutes. And then our computer knows whether your flight was delayed or cancelled. It possibly knows how many passengers are involved, what was happening, whether in Rome Fiumicino there was a fire, and that's force majeure, or whether the plane had a technical fault. And then we investigate within a few seconds what the legal basis is and whether there are other soft factors involved. And if we see that your case can't be ruled out by one thing or another, then we ask you for your personal data and you request flight right to take this on on your behalf. Then we write to the airline and ask for the 400 euros, say. We in try to assert that claim, and if we have a good relationship with the airline, which we do with most of them, they say, aha, here's flight right, they've already looked at this, the details are right, it really was late, they're correct, and then they'll pay the 400 euros. If we don't have such a good relationship with the airline, then they're going to say, aha, here's flight right. But nevertheless, in our case, everyone needs to go to court. Then we will go to court. And in I think 180 courts around Europe we have sued, then we will have to go to court and we hope that a judge will decide in our favor. It won't happen as quickly as the first line of attack, but ultimately you will get your money. And if we succeed, we take a 30% cut. You get 70% of your compensation and you've only spent a minute or two on the case and have not incurred any risk. We now have another option which is really based on artificial intelligence and it's called Flight Right Now. But we only offer this if we're really sure, or rather our algorithm is really sure, that we're going to win this case and then you automatically subsume or the algorithm automatically subsumes a lot of data points about the flight and then we will offer you that we will immediately purchase your claim from you so that within eight minutes you can have the money on your account. We will take on the risk. We will hope that the airline does not go bust, which does sometimes happen. And after eight minutes, you finished. And ho we hope you're happy. That is, let's say, the holy grail for any lawyer, that the temporal delta between being right and enforcing your claim is reduced to eight minutes. We're pretty happy that we've achieved that. I don't think anyone else in the world has done that. Live, you can ask for your money from on your account or through PayPal. Now we have the problem with Air Berlin, don't we? They've just reported bankruptcy last week or a few weeks ago. What happens in these complex cases? Well, unfortunately, as is always the case, if a company says that it's going bankrupt, the ordinary consumer is not going to be top of the list when it comes to the payout. So an administrator comes along, looks at the residual assets belonging to that company, those will all be sold off, and what's left is used to pay off creditors 
according to a certain priority and the air passengers quite often simply won't get anything. Sometimes we are unlucky in life. Yes, but I read that you belong to an association called Silicon Sanssouci. What is that about? Silicon Sanssouci obviously borrows its name from Silicon Valley, combined with Schloss Sanssouci, which is a palace here in Potsdam. So it's a loose alliance of IT providers, lawyers, other people, all based in Potsdam. We're trying to do something for Potsdam as an IT location, as an economic location, setting up projects. We're working with SAP, who are based near here as well. And we're saying this is a fantastic place to work from. It's not just Berlin Valley. Potsdam has plenty to offer too. I see that diversity is one of your important issues on your website. You've got employees from all over the world. What about the ratio of men to women? Because women, unfortunately, are still not very visible in the world of IT. We are a company startup, which of course is very IT based. And of course, it's the case that in the IT team, I think we only have one woman, sadly. But apart from that, I think we have a very healthy ratio of women right across the company, whether it's lawyers, customer services, human resources, finance. 70% of that department, I think, is female. So I'd say, I hope I'm not wrong, but I think we're about 50-50 men and women. So I think we do fairly well in terms of diversity. Great. But what about the shortage of resources? That's a very important issue these days. We try to be quite structured about what we need in the next quarter. We call it objective key results, OKRs. So we think, what do our teams need to achieve in the next three months, realistically? And then we try to be very focused specifically on those projects so that we can allocate resources accordingly. And that helps us a little, I think, because you always have plenty of ideas, lots of projects you could do and not enough resources. But that helps bearing in mind that we need to identify what's most important and concentrate on what we think will help us most in the next three months. That's our approach. What about environmental protection? Is that important in IT? I'm sure it is. I think there's a trend to use far too much packaging and we try to pay attention to such details. But I wouldn't claim that uh, we are particularly exemplary. I think this is something we've clocked that we pay attention to. We're aware of it, but I'm sure there are other companies that set better examples that only use green power, for example, or the most energy-saving computers. I'm sure we could improve. How do you combine work and life? It's not always easy. It's a discussion I have with my wife, but it's also something that I need to weigh up inside myself, asking myself, have you spent enough time with the family? And I think one of the biggest problems is this digital detoxing. For example, if you're on holiday, like me, the last two weeks, that you force yourself really to switch off your mobile phone or maybe leave it at home and not constantly look to see if you've got an email because it constantly distracts you from relaxing. 
It happens when you go home in the evening too. You've got your children, but you keep looking at your emails, making phone calls, and that's not great. So, can I improve? But one thing we did do, and I always said to my wife that a startup is a bit like having another child. You need to invest a lot of time in it. But a point comes when you ask for a payback. And in November 2014, a year and a half ago, we got to that point. After five years of flight right, we said, okay, we're going to take six months off as a family. We all went out to South Africa. And there, it really is the case that for five months, I didn't make a single professional phone call and I didn't read any emails. And that was my way of making up the work-life balance in a five-year perspective. What do you like about being an entrepreneur? We often talk about this, but what are the positive sides? What I really like is that you can do a great many things. You're your own boss. As a trained lawyer, I'm quite used to being able to reflect to to respond to what the clients want of me. You're exposed to their demands. But as an entrepreneur, you can forge your own destiny. You can pursue the risks you want to pursue. You can do things the way you want. So that gives you a great deal of freedom. And you can shape the way you want things to be a great deal. You have a lot of scope for mobility. And you're working with fantastic people. And it's really fun to build up a company and watch it grow. And if you can see that it works, especially after such a tough beginning, and other people think it's good, make use of it, it gives you a good feeling, personal satisfaction, builds your confidence, and it's fun. And, perhaps the last thing, once you've done it, you dare to do more other things. You think about other ideas you could maybe go for. Once you've been successful with a step like that, then you dare more. You're prepared to go another step and another one. So I'm very satisfied with it. That would be my next question. What plans do you have for the future? I'm sure you have a vision. Basically, I think that there are a lot of similar constellations to Flight Right, where consumers and sometimes companies have rights but don't have access to those rights. And if we can help, whether we're talking about parking tickets or insurance, to create that level playing field between the consumers and the companies, or also expand in the air passenger rights field, because there are other things too involving luggage or people who need more information at airports. If we can expand our service, that's what our vision is focusing on. What about people who would like to become ITs or IT experts or lawyers? What would you recommend? Well, with lawyers, I would certainly recommend that they are aware of digital transformation and rights and how that affects lawyers and not to assume that things are going to carry on as they were and to adopt a more interdisciplinary approach because whether we're looking at legal hacking or other such issues, I'm sure there's a future there. Computer systems and those kind of issues. Not to allow an aversion to technology to get the better of you. Look at legal tech. As for IT specialists, there's not much I can say to them. I don't know. People with IT skills are more in demand than ever. I would suggest to people who don't have those skills that they study IT. 
big data, machine learning, because there are really exciting things you can do and you can earn money with it too. Okay, last question. What's the most important thing in life? The most important thing in life? I'd say probably to me it's family, personal contentment, but maybe also getting something moving, creating something. Basically, I think it's personal contentment, happy family, happy environment. Okay, and that, you radiate that too. And thank you very much for the work you've been doing and for your time. Thank you.